Hello, and welcome. I am Scarberlocka. This is City of Heroes. We're level 23 with our Dominator now, Mr. Eclipse. 52,000 XP to go to get to the next level. I just leveled up, and we're on the Hand of Iron story arc for um, Claire Childress. And if we 20 Freak Show, can I auto-complete that? Yeah, let's just get rid of that. I don't like those missions. Um, so, uh, let's take a look. Oh, gosh. There's two different story arcs. All right, let's take a look. What I did was I added a couple of slots to Nightfall. Nightfall is an awesome power. It does great AoE, so I want to get that thing slotted up. I at least want it recharging faster so that we can cast it every 10 seconds instead of every, whatever it was, 14. <clears throat> I want to get Possess, Nightfall, and Dark Blast all slotted up as quickly as possible. Living Shadows I've been using a lot too. Haunt, a lot too. Haven't used Shadowfield that much. The thing with Shadowfield is it's an AoE hold, and when and it you know, it, it sort of works, sort of doesn't. I mean, I think it's got to be enhanced. But like basically, with Dark Grasp and Possess, you've got two or three people stopped, and then I can throw Dark Grasp on the third person because um, it recharges what in like five seconds, and it lasts the duration for 25. So I can hit one guy. You know, I can possess one, hold one immobilize the one, exchange a couple of blows with him, and then hold the other one in five seconds. And those guys aren't going anywhere, right? We're, we have them confused and held for 20, 30 seconds. And then I can just refresh as necessary. I haven't really had to use Shadow Field, so it'll be better when I enhance it, but I, it's not high on the priority list. Um, frankly, I only use the Haunts against tough enemies. So I feel like these four powers are my bread and butter right now on this side, and these four on this side. I haven't used Engulfing Darkness much either, because again, it's only a point blank AOE. We're doing pretty well with this character. I don't think we're ready to move up to plus ones yet with him, but uh, you know, like the because the the missions with plus ones often ha with, with plus zeros often have plus ones in them. But plus ones themselves are not a problem. And if they didn't ever go up to plus one to the mission and give us plus twos, which I don't think we can handle, I would almost be ready to move this guy up to plus ones at level twenty three, which is pretty good given that he's a Dominator. Now, he definitely moves much more slowly through missions than something like a Scrapper. You have to be more careful, but I don't mind that, and um, it's been a lot of fun playing him. Now, let's talk about uh, what we're going to be discussing today. Um, we may be talking about a couple of things, uh, depending on how long the episode gets and how much I ta talk about each individual thing, um, but uh, I want to reference a comment a couple of episodes back in the episode about... GM burnout and um, ODX made a great comment. Um, the first thing I do want to mention is in the comment, ODX mentioned that a very good friend passed away many years ago who used to be the GM of their group. And first, again, I know it's been a long time, but my condolences, it's always horrible when you lose a friend like that. Um, and it's especially hard when you lose the GM of the group because, you know, you, you could, once you get over the, you know, the loss, still play with a, in a group that has a bunch of players in it and one of the players dies but when the gm dies um, you lose the guy who's been running all the games and so odx has kind of become over the last couple decades the permit gm for that group and um odx said you know i, I really kind of would rather play but nobody else can or wants to do it and so i do the gming even though i really kind of don't want to and um so i really wanted to talk about that because i i said this in the post but i, I really want to mention this when it comes to gm burnout um it can happen because you're gming when you don't want to but what i really want to do is give a shout out not just to odx but to all of the gms out there and guys there are thousands of them who really would rather play they don't really want to GM, but they know that no one in their group can or will be able to do it. And, you know, maybe they wouldn't be good at it. They don't like it. They would be a terrible GM. They, they don't have time. They've got kids. They've got a wife, got a husband, whatever. Um, and these guys take the hit every single session, guys and gals, take the hit every single session and in between sessions while doing prep of being... Uh, doing the job nobody else wants to do because without them, their group doesn't play, right? And it's very important to them to play and to be able to have a D&D &D or a Champions or a Rollmaster or whatever experience 
with their friends. They've had, got a good group. Everybody, they enjoy being together. They enjoy being with each other. They enjoy playing together. And they realize it's either me, I, either I do this or we don't play. And so even though they'd rather not, they do it. And they take that hit. And I, I want to give a shout out to all the Game Masters because it's, it's not a small number. It's a large number of people who would very much rather let somebody else run the game but can't. And so they do it because without that, they don't play. And they're willing to um, take that, take it basically on the chin for the group in a way that a GM who's enjoying the GMing and wants to do it preferentially, prefers to do it, doesn't. Right, like it's even more of a sacrifice for those folks like ODX who would really rather just play. And um, so I just want to give a shout out to that. It happens. Um, it's not super fun when it happens. Uh, honestly, it happened originally to me. Now, I like GMing. Right? I've always enjoyed that. So I do like to GM. But in my D and D group, right, that I'm currently that, that I, that's now my Deadlands group, right? That group was started by somebody at my job, right? A friend of mine, a colleague at work. We were talking about. Uh, I basically I started off talking about City of Heroes coming back to uh, to the world in 2019 with him, and that's where he how he found out kind of I was a gamer, and I found out that he was playing D and D on Zoom with his friends. I didn't even know what Zoom was at the time, right? This is before the pandemic. And I really hadn't had any reason to do something like use Zoom, so I didn't really know anything about it. And uh, so he was describing what they did, and my best friend was watching Critical Role and really, really wanted to play D&D, &D, but he didn't have anybody local to play with. I wanted to play some, you know, role-playing games, but I didn't have anybody local to play with. And this friend of mine, his D&D &D campaign, which was run by somebody else, wrapped up, and they weren't going to play for a while. And so what he said is, I want to run something. And he got me and the new girl, who was one of my, uh, had been a colleague of mine at work, but had just started a new job and was off on the other side of the state. And I guess so that we could stay in touch with her, he said, well, let's, let's play with her. And he had two or three other friends um, from a previous job that were living in like Arizona and Colorado, and we were all going to play together online. And he didn't tell me this, but he was going to run... Um, the uh, Descent into Avernus module from Dungeons and Dragons, right? So we're going to play 5th edition. Because one of the things I had said to him, because he had said, if you want to play D&D, &D, why don't you just, you know, you and your friends get together and, you know. And I said, well, I, I don't really feel comfortable GMing for an edition of D&D &D I've never even played once. Right, it's not like I played it for a while. I'd seen a few episodes of Critical Role, but that's not the same thing as playing it. And I said, yeah, I really feel like in order to run a game, I need to play it at least a little bit. I have literally never GM'd. My best friend has. He always started out GMing for us, so he was my first DM in D and D, and he had never seen it DM any anybody DM D and D. So uh, I always talk about the good Rob changing my GM style a little bit, but a lot of my GMing style is based on my best friend's style. And um, it's because he's the first DM I ever had. So when I took over after doing like Cave A and the Caves of Chaos with the party and we switched and then I became the GM and did Cave B, uh, I, did, I did it the way he did it. I described, you know, battles the way he did it. I described map mapping and hallways the way he did it. I kept track of, you know, the time of torches and everything the way he did it. I kept track of hit points. The way I like, I told him, show me how you do it, and then I just sort of copied what he did, right? And so, um, then when we bought Champions, he was the first Champions GM too. So he's actually GM games he's never played before, but I haven't. I had played through the entire A section, which is a small kobold cave network of the Caves of Chaos, before I ever G DM'd D and D, and I had played through. Uh, a champion scenario of a couple of agent battles and a battle with some villains that run by my best friend that took us a couple sessions in, in his basement over the summer one year or fall, I guess. Um, I like I did I played through that before I ran a game. Uh, I played through Rollmaster with my my the, the good Rob, who's the one who introduced us to Rollmaster, ran an entire summer. 
And then the next year, a couple of uh, another friend and I co-GM'd our own little custom world and uh, did some really cool stuff with it. And then he got tired of it, and I started like perma GMing Rollmaster, and I perma GM Champions, and like these are things that I did after I had played the game. Now I, I did try running the FASA Star Trek role playing game without having played it, but we we did that very very little of that, um, and for the most part. Most of the time when I've run games, it's been after playing an adventure or a few sessions under somebody else and seeing how they do it. So I told this friend of mine at work, I would not be comfortable running 5th edition. You know, I've never run since 1st edition d and I've played Neverwinter Nights is as close as I've gotten to playing 3rd edition. Never played 4th, never played 2nd really, uh, because we had switched to Rollmaster by then. And so I said, I don't really feel comfortable running a game of D&D &D when I haven't GM'd in, you know, 18 years or something. And, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I haven't GM'd in 18 years. And on top of that, I haven't ever played a single session of 5e. He said, oh, it's no problem, whatever. So after he couldn't convince me to do that, he said, okay, I'll run something for you. And... I think his initial plan, I don't know if he was planning to go the way through Descent into Avernus or just play a small part of it. I don't know anything about that module, really. Um, but I think his plan was to run uh, this. He, he came up with this idea in the fall, like September of 2019. And he said, we'll start after Thanksgiving when the, when the holidays roll around. We'll start over the holidays and then we'll play in the spring. And I think his plan was to run it until the summer. And then he was, if the pandemic hadn't happened, he was going to be going out and doing field work. So he wasn't going to be able to do it. And I think what he was going to probably do is play it for six months and then try to hand the reins over to me and say, okay, you played it now, you can do some jamming, right? And I've got a group of players built in and we're ready to go and then he can just play. That's I guess, I'm guessing that's what he would have done. Um, but I don't know because that never happened, right? What ended up happening was he was super busy and then uh, we didn't start before the holidays because he was a little too busy and he said, we'll start in January. And then in January, his wife started having some major mental health issues and he had to deal with that and he really couldn't gm for us and when i when he told me what was going on i said to him okay look i don't think you know i i said would you mind i would be willing you know would you mind stepping aside i'll take over i think it'll be easier for you and he said oh yeah it would be a lot easier if you would gm and he became a player and then he got so wrapped up in what was going on with his family that not only couldn't he gm but he couldn't even play anymore and so um he uh, he um, are there more of these than I realize? I guess there are. Let's do uh, one of those. Um, so I then took over GMing fifth edition. I didn't want to, right? I did it because if I don't take over, we're not going to play, <clears throat> right? And now people had gotten all excited about playing. And I didn't want everybody, including my best friend, who was, would have been really upset, to be disappointed. And including me. Like, I, he'd got me all excited to do some D&D &D now. And the only way to do it was going to be for me to run it. Right? So I know what it's like to say I don't really want to be the GM, but if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. <clears throat> right? And it can be a little frustrating. And it can be a little draining because what you really want to do is just play and have fun and not be um, burdened by... Where is he? Where? Not be burdened by, you know, having to do all the prep work, having to make sure everything's balanced, having to read all, all the rules for everybody, not just for your own character. It's so much easier in a role-playing game to sit there and say, okay, my character wants to attack this and the GM says, roll a d20. And you don't have to figure out what to roll. The GM tells you what to roll. And you're just doing whatever he says. It's so much easier. right? And sometimes you just want it easy. And um, so it can be very challenging to have to be the GM when you don't want to be. And, um, and you know, I've experienced it firsthand. And, you know, again, it's better than, you know, there's that the old Matt Coble saying no D&D &D is better than bad D&D. &D. Well, DMing D&D &D is better than not having any D&D &D at all, if you really want to play. 
right? Um, and I, I, like my best friend, ended up in addition to playing our game into getting getting into paid games with strangers. I am not willing to do that because to me, a role playing game is something you sit around and play with your friends, right? The activity has to include. It can't just be Savage Worlds or Deadlands or whatever. It has to be Deadlands with friends because to me, they go together, right? My favorite thing to do with my friends when we were younger and in college and high school and junior high and everything was to get together and play role-playing games with them. I never played role-playing games with people I didn't know or didn't like because to me, being with your friends was is an integral part of the activity. It's part of the definition for me, not for my best friend. He, you know, Now he said, look, I became friends with these people after I played with them and I understand that, but I've always, I've only ever played games like D&D or Champions with my existing friends. And so, um, it's sort of like MMOs. I don't enjoy doing pickup groups. I keep forgetting that these guys res. Very few of them have. I feel like a lot higher percentage of them res when I was playing Scrappers and Stalkers over the years. Um, so, anyway, I just wanted to talk about that and point out that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of GMs in the world who are um, who are not who, who would rather just play, okay? They would much rather just play, but because their friends need them to GM and their group needs them to do it, they do it. Just like I did when the guy who was supposed to be our GM said, I can't, or, well, he, he didn't even say I can't do it. He was just telling me what was going on and I walked back to my office and I thought this guy is never going to be able to prepare and run a D&D game. Right, he is so um, focused on his wife and her mental health issues, and they have two little children, including a baby, and you know, like her health issues were causing her not to be able. She had some physical health issues that were causing the mental health issues. It was it was a whole mess, right? And she's much better now. Although you know, he just said she got COVID, but up until last week when she caught COVID, she's been much much better in the last couple of years. But for a couple of years, oh boy. Domination. Hold. Oh boy. Hold. Oh man. Lock in place. Hold. Of course I ran, hit the wall. Alright, and you help me. Yeah. I did not realize he was going to be in that corner there. Where are my... Oh, they're there. I was like, where are my little guys? Um, so, yeah... One thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people make this sacrifice. Uh, you know, I saw that he, like, just from what he was saying, I was like, this guy is never going to have time to run a D&D game. So I went back to his office after thinking about it for a while. I thought, should I just run something? And I'd been kind of toying with the idea of what sort of world I would do and everything. I'd gotten the idea for Rome and all that um, already. And so I went back to his office. And I said, um, do you have a minute? And he said, yeah. And I said, look, if you want to, I said, I, you know, I don't want you to be overburdened doing D&D &D stuff with, with what's going on with your wife. If you prefer, I can, uh, I can run it. And he said, oh, thank you. That would be such a huge burden off my plate, not having to worry about that. Because he said, I feel really bad that I haven't been able to do anything for you guys, but just the way things are right now, I can't. Right, and so I just said, "Don't worry about it. Um, I'll take over." And so I did that because he needed me to, and I ended up jamming for a couple of years. And my best friend said he would take over after my campaign was done, and then he wasn't ready, right? And so one of the other guys did a short campaign. He was like, "Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind jamming for a little while." So he did a short campaign. And then when his short campaign was over, we said to my best friend, are you ready now? And he said, not yet. So I said, okay, would you guys like to try some other games? They tried uh, Deadlands with Coffin Rock. I purposely picked a, um, a, a short adventure that would only last, you know, four or five sessions, which is what it did. And um, I want to teleport up there, but I can't <laughs> zoom back enough, far enough. There we go. Come on. There we go. 
um, uh, we played Coffin Rock, and as we got toward the end, I said, you know, we're getting toward the end of Coffin Rock. Are you ready yet? And he said, I, I'm still not ready. It's going to be a while. And that's when I said, do, well, do we want to do a longer campaign? Now, part of the problem, I think, with doing this is knowing we're in a long campaign and it's going to last for six months or a year, he's like, I, got, I don't have to work on it now for a while. It's like, no, you should start working on it immediately, right, so that it's done. So we've got a ways to go in our horror at Headstone Hill campaign, probably. But, you know, if these guys find out what's going on really quick, um, we might be done faster than he expects. I don't think he's ready. He hasn't said anything to me. Like I, I've said this before. I'm convinced that when he really gets going on the world building, he's going to be peppering us with questions and and wanting to know what we want and what we like, and so that he can tailor his world building to what we like. Um, I know at one point he was talking about building his own world, but then using like Waterdeep or Neverwinter or um, one of the existing. Uh, cities that are in one of the setting books for the city because he doesn't want to have to make the whole city up and having gone through with Horror of Headstone Hill I can say yes that's like I told him that's smart right is it take like to, to build a living breathing city right I did it the first couple like a town and a, and a larger city in uh, Rome and then they kept changing where they were right kept going to new towns and I kept having to do it and it, it gets hard to keep coming up with unique stuff and these companies like, pay professional writers and game designers to do this for you so it does make your life a lot easier so man i've loved running headstone hill because even if it's not something i've exactly prepped for they can walk into any building and i can just look what my notes say about that building and um just uh tell them what's there and run the npc and you know the one uh player even said it really does feel like we can go anywhere and do anything, you're doing a great job on this sandbox. So, um, anyway, my best friend, I think he would still be asking questions because I think one of the things he, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think one of the things he implied to me was that he was going to pick which city to do uh, of the available ones based on like what what we thought we would like to do in the world. And he hasn't said anything since. So I don't know if he's changed his mind about that. It's possible. But I suspect that he probably does want to do that still. And he would be asking us questions if he was actually doing any world building. Now maybe he's changed his mind. He's not going to world build at all. And he's just going to run one of the adventures. I know at one point I said to him, he really liked the rhyme. I've said this before. He really liked the rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Um, when he played it. And I said to him, if it's good, why don't you just run it for us? Right? Like, you've already played through it, so it will be really easy for you to run because you've seen it played through. I said, the only thing you got to avoid is trying to kind of get us to do it the way your existing group did it, right? Like, you're not going to be able to get us to make all the decisions that your group made. That, you know, as long as you are, you know, it, it's very hard on an unconscious level not to try and get the other group to play it the same way. Um, I mean, I struggled with this with the great supervillain contest because I ran it for two groups at my, you know, group in high school and then my my permanent GMing stint in college. And, um, you know, I had to very consciously force myself not to try and get events to work out in the great supervillain contest the way they had worked out the first time because this is a different group of players with a different group of characters in a different world. I thought I saw Glowy back here, but I did not. I do not. So, uh, but I said, why don't you do that? And then uh, he didn't hear this, so I, I think I told him. I think I messaged him. I must have, um, just to warn him. But um, I mentioned this to one of the, to like the one week when he couldn't make it because he was sick. I mentioned this to one of the other players that I had said to him, oh, you should use that. And he said, oh, yeah, that's a really cool adventure. I like that one. Like, what? Oh, he, he's read a bunch of them. So one of the problems my best friend is going to have is that one of the other players has read a bunch of these modules just, like, for the fun of it, because he thinks they're fun to read. And I think he has plans to maybe someday run them for his son or whatever, and so he reads them to see which one he wants to run, you know? Um, but that's not going to happen for years, because the son's still pretty young. And I, I haven't heard any indication that the son is interested in D&D &D at this point. 
So I don't know. But um, but yeah, unfortunately, my best friend can't run right with the Frost Maiden because this guy has already read the whole thing. I don't think he's played it, but he's read it. And read it enough to know, oh, it's if that's a cool adventure, I would like to play in it. I'm like, what? I mean, I don't know. Uh, to me, I'm I'm not going to read the stuff I want to play in because I want to be surprised. In any case, um, my best friend has kept saying he's going to do it, but then hasn't, right? And, okay, well, if it weren't for that, there isn't anybody who can run right now. Right? And so, um, we wouldn't be playing if I weren't running something. So, you know, I'm hesitating because this makes me think I should probably bring up the fact that, you know, we never agreed to just permanently play Deadlands. And we've been playing it for like over a year. And I'm happy. I love Deadlands. But are you guys still happy? Do you want to keep doing this? Or do you want to, like, once we finish um, Headstone Hill, do you want to switch to a different game? Do you want to switch GMs? Like, what do you guys want to do? Um, Stuart had talked about, uh, my best friend, his name is Stuart, had talked about um, GMing. And um, he's talked about it on and off, but he's never really done it. Is he still planning to? Um, I... I I should give them the option, right, to tell me, you know, we'd like to wrap up Headstone Hill, maybe not, you know, right away, but in the next three or four months, the next, you know, five, six sessions. And uh, I don't know, because the two of them want to get to Legendary rank, and they're just one advance from Veteran, and after Veteran is Heroic, and it's about four advances, four levels. So they just hit the cone of seventh level. At eighth level, they become Veterans at... Um, at 12th level, they become heroic, and at 16th level, they become uh, legendary. And uh, so, the um, somebody keeps shooting me. Who did I not? Did I not control you? Go fight the other guys. Um, so, I I feel like two of them, at least, including my best friend, aren't going to want to stop until they hit legendary. <laughs> but I don't know. Right, and there's a new D and D, you know, a new edition of D and D or, or pseudo edition, whatever you want to call it, is just coming out. I don't want to play it, but they might, and I, I just don't know. And so, I, you know, they they have a right to make these choices too. Um, it's not all what I want, of course, but I've, you know, I really enjoy running Deadlands, and I've enjoyed running the Heart at Headstone Hill, and I enjoyed running Coffin Rock. Blood Drive was okay. I, it was okay. I didn't hate running it, but I didn't love it as much as the other two campaigns. But I've had a lot of fun with the Savage World stuff. I've really enjoyed running their stuff. I really enjoy the setting, and I love running uh, Savage Worlds. So um, I'm having a lot of fun with it, and as far as I'm concerned, I could keep running for quite some time, and I would not mind. Um, but... Uh, wow, I missed with that thing twice. Um, but, you know, it, it always is a bit of a sacrifice. And as I mentioned in my comments section, um, one of the things that I decided to do because we were canceling our Deadlands games a lot, we weren't getting to play at all because of people's schedules in the spring and summer. Actually, it was last fall. Uh, I said... Um, you know, maybe what we could do is do a play-by post and I'm running it, right? Because they don't have time. So now I'm running two things. I, I kind of wish one of them had said, you know what, Scrapper, you take a break. I'll run a play-by post, right? <coughs> it would be nice to have a break and just be a player. Um, but again, why am I doing the play-by-post, because if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it, and if we don't do play-by-post, there might be whole months where we don't do any role-playing at all. Now, my best friend's not part of that, because he doesn't because he doesn't need it, right? He's role-playing with... Wow, am I missing a lot all of a sudden. He's role-playing with um, all of his online paid games, right? So he doesn't really need to um, get that extra role-playing fix 
but the rest of the players, like everyone but for everyone but him, we are the only group that we all play in, right? That it's it's us or nothing, and so it's very helpful to us to have that additional fix, especially when we might go three or four weeks in between sessions the way we did over the summer. I mean, we only played from like June. Uh, 6th or something to August 8th, we only played in mid-July once. And we played without the new girl. And so, um, no, sorry, we played it twice. I can't remember now. Yeah, once, twice. In, from May, sorry, to, I don't know, over like a two-month period, we only played twice. It was very nice to have the play-by-post now, you know, since it's mostly the same players, sometimes if somebody sometimes if somebody's too busy to play the game with us uh, in the Discord, you know, in the in the Zoom, the uh, same person can't make posts. Um, in the play by post, so sometimes they can't do it either, but. Uh, but oftentimes they can, you know, you can just get on your in Discord with your phone or your tablet and um, do a little bit, you know, do a one-line post and, you know, or pass your turn or whatever. And so we've uh, we've been able to keep up a lot more consistent role-playing in the play-by-post. Although I feel like over the summer the posting rate has slowed down, even for me sometimes. I know at one point, like, they had gone, the last person had said I pass, and I didn't realize it. And I went three or four days. We're supposed to post within 48 hours. And I went like four days, hadn't posted anything. And I realized, oops, I didn't realize it was my turn. Um, so, you know, that sometimes happens. But, um, but yeah, I, it, it can be very difficult when you don't want to run the game. And that can lead to GM burnout too. And I think um, ODX and people like ODX who are really do not want to GM, right? Like for me with D&D &D, 5e, right? It wasn't that I didn't want to DM at all. It was that I was hesitant to DM when I didn't know the system well by playing it, right? I had always intended to take over eventually to like be the next GM after the guy at work. Always planned to do that. So um, I like GMing, so I don't mind doing it. I don't necessarily always want to be the forever GM, but I don't mind doing it because I like the activity of GMing. So there are lots of people who really would rather not GM at all, and um, ODX seems to be one of them, and I think we need to recognize and appreciate all those GMs out there. You know how, like, you have they have, like, Mother's Day and Father's Day and stuff, and Grandparents' Day, and it's, it's Secretary's Week, or what do they call it now, Administrative Assistance Week, right? This idea that these people are doing things for you and you want to give them some appreciation and thanks for all that they do. Well, I feel like we need a National Game Master's Day because a lot of people who are GMs are doing it simply out of the goodness of their heart. They don't like the power, want the power. They don't really need this right now in their lives and it would be easier for them if they weren't GMing and they would really prefer to just play. But they're taking it on the chin for the group so that everyone can have fun. And I think those folks need to be acknowledged. So ODX, I, I acknowledge you and all the other people out there who are GMing kind of against their preference. They're doing it because their group needs them to do it. They enjoy it probably, right? Like, obviously ODX wouldn't do it if, if it was terrible for uh, a terrible experience for them. But they'd really rather play. And... There just isn't anybody else to do it, and it's either this or we don't play at all, so I'll go ahead and make the sacrifice. And making the sacrifice for one week is one thing, but making it for months and years, session after session, for five sessions, ten sessions, fifteen sessions, twenty sessions. One thing I would say to people who have a permanent GM, even if you think the permanent GM loves it, even if he's told you he loves it or she's told you they'd like to adore it and they love it, it's their favorite thing to do in the world, Everyone who's in a game group that has someone else GMing for them and has had that for a long time, I recommend to you go to that GM and say, hey, Joe, Steve, Sarah, Bobby, 
you know, Lana, whatever their name is, you've been GMing for a long time and I really appreciated it. And to show your appreci my appreciation for it, if you'd like, I'd be happy to run something, you know, give you a little bit of a spell when we get to the, when we get to a natural break point, finish this dungeon, whatever, uh, finish this scenario, if it's champions, finish this particular story arc, whatever it happens to be, if you would like, and the rest of the group would like to, I'd be happy to give you a chance to sit on the other side of the screen, and I'll take over and just run, you know, I call it a one-shot, but don't do it just for one session, right? Make a short thing, something like Coffin Rock from Deadlands, where it's a, it's a contain, it's a town, a little town, a single plot, Right, there's a bunch of people who are involved in the plot, but it's basically a single plot. It's a single town. There are some subplots. You can just ignore those. I mostly did. And it's just somebody trying to summon a demon and using the power of an e of, a, of a spirit that they've bound to summon that demon. I mean, you don't have to play this adventure, but my point is just something short that you can play in two to five sessions, right? Three or four sessions. If you're playing weekly, four sessions would give the GM a whole month off. If you're playing bi-weekly, give them two months off. Um, and just say, uh, I, I, you know, I just like to give you a break so that you can play. Now, the GM may say, I don't need a break. I'm super happy. And if they say that, that's fine. I think some GMs are afraid to let somebody else game master because they might be afraid that if they really like to GM, that the group might like the other GM better and might not want them back. Like, if you're a GM, don't worry about it. That's not going to happen, right? The other player who's going to GM temporarily, 99.9% .9 of the time, they don't want a permanent GMing gig, right? And I go back to the story of my friend Dave, who took over uh, for me over the summer, and he was supposed to take over for more of the summer than he actually took over for because he said his words, they're driving me crazy. You have to take back over. Um, he gave it right back to me. And by the way, they were thrilled when I took back over because Dave had a very different GMing style from mine. He didn't prepare the same way. He was a lot more seat of his pants. And my players weren't used to it. What he did wasn't objectively wrong. Okay. And some game groups might have liked the way he ran it better. Because my games were, my scenarios were pretty railroady. I mean, like there was a story and you were supposed to follow it. Right. And Dave's was much more loosey goosey. We didn't even know. Like we were very they were very frustrated because they didn't we didn't know what we were supposed to do. Right. And they were really frustrated about this. Um, whereas mine, they always knew what they were supposed to do because mine were kind of railroady. Um, another group of players might have preferred the loosey goosey sandboxy kind of style. Um, and m the players of my group might have gotten used to it if Dave had run longer and come back to me and said, your adventures are too rigid, right? But the reality is most of the time what's gonna happen is if you're in a group that's got had a GM for a long time and they're used to each other and they enjoy each other and they're used to that person's GMing style, the new GMing style is gonna frustrate and aggravate the other players. So you don't really have to worry about that they're gonna like the other GM better. And the worst case scenario is they like the other GM better, the other guy likes GMing, and your responsibilities are absolved, and you can just play. For 99% of GMs, that would not be bad news, at least for a couple of years <laughs> before they got the itch to start GMing again, right? And, like, if when my best friend took over from the Rome game, and he did six, he did about six, five, six months, and um, then there was that other guy, John, who... Didn't, didn't seem to want to play with me as the GM, but he's willing to play with me as a player. And he'd been with us for a while, and my best friend was trying to get this John to play with us, but John expressed no real interest in going back to Rome, right? I If, if my best friend had said, look, I want to keep John around, um, Scrapper, would you mind if I, we just keep playing in my world? Uh, the new girl would have probably objected to that because she wanted to do the Rome stuff. She wanted to see where that ends, and some of the other players may have as well. But I would have been perfectly happy to say, guys, I can tell you how it ends, you know, um, to, to, to slake your curiosity. And, you know, to me, people are more important than campaign. And so if this guy wants to play with us and we want him to play with us, and for whatever reason he doesn't want to play in Rome, then we don't play in Rome, right? We, we tailor the game to what everybody wants. And if he's happy playing in my best friend's um, 
whatever he was doing uh, wasn't water deep. Where the heck were we in here? Oh, uh, the castle. What the uh, candle keep? If he wanted a candle keep, had adventures to take you to level seventeen, right? If if everybody had wanted to stay in there, and this guy John would have stayed with us, I was actually hoping that my best friend would just take over and run it because it was so much easier for me on a week to week basis than it was to hey, keep having to prep this stuff and, and make things up and homebrew everything. You know, I liked it, but it was work. And I got to tell you, for those couple of months where I didn't have to worry about it, I was like enjoying not having all that work. Same thing in the summer when Dave took over. I enjoyed having a break. I mean, I was prepping because I knew I was going to take back over and we were doing a crossover. So I was slowly prepping and making up villains and agents and, and minions and things like that and drawing maps. But I was able, instead of doing it at the breakneck pace where I'm like doing a map a day, right, every day for a week and I'm doing, I'm making up, you know, a villain a day every day for a week and every day for every week, I would make up a villain a week, a map a week because I've got some time, right? And so... um it was a much more relaxed way to approach it. And if I hadn't taken back over, I probably been, that's fine. You know, now it couldn't have worked that way for my group because Dave was going back to college and the other people were staying in our town and he wouldn't have been able to run for us. But if he'd been home and said, look, I'm going to run forever, I've been like, that's all right, fine with me. You know, easier for me to just play my character, whose name was Cardinal, I believe, and had wings. It's easier for me to just play Cardinal. Like, that's super easy compared to running the whole game right so i would say you know if you're a player make the offer um if you're a gm accept the offer don't don't be afraid that they're gonna like the other guy better it's no big deal if they do uh let's work for you right now if you really love gming obviously you know you're gonna have to do something like rotating gms but hey that's also a lot less work for you than if you're just doing everything and so, um, again, if, if you're a player, go to your GM, offer to run something. I think they'll appreciate it. Even if they say you don't have to, they'll appreciate the offer. And you as a player, if you've never done it, you will get an appreciation for what it's like on the other side of the screen. It is a lot more fun than you think it is. It's probably a lot more work than you think it is. But the work is fun. And you'll get to see what it's like to have to deal with all of the things during a session that the GM has to deal with. And then as a GM, if you let the other player run for a while, then you can just take care of one player character. Do you know how much easier it is to just run a character sheet? Um, and at heck, if you're a player, offer to run a different game, right? Really let everybody take a break. And um, the other thing that makes it easier for you if you're running a different game, you don't have to run Savage Worlds the way D&D is run. In fact, you can't run it that way. So there won't be these inevitable comparisons like there were with my friend Dave, where they were comparing how he ran Champions 4th Edition to how I ran Champions 4th Edition, right? Instead, it's how you run Pathfinder compared to how I run Savage Worlds. Well, they're to two totally different games, right? So then... You don't have to do these comparisons, and people won't make those comparisons that much in their heads, and you just play the new game, right? So anyway, I, I strongly encourage people to do that. Swap it out. Be, be offered to do it. Um, if you're a GM and you're getting burnt out, you're getting tired, say to the other players, guys, I could use a break. Would anyone like to try GMing maybe a different role-playing game? I've always wanted to try Pathfinder 2E. or Well, I don't know. May, I'm not sure you want to suggest Pathfinder, because that's a pretty steep investment of time and money. But so, Shadow Dark... Um, Dungeon Crawl Classics, things like that are easier to run. Uh, or something one of the players may have mentioned to you before that they really want to play Call of Cthulhu. Well, you want to, want to do some Cthulhu? We, we can try it. It'll be fun. You don't have to run, you know, the Horror and the Orient Express for 17 sessions. You can just do two or three. Right? I mean, all the characters are going to die or go crazy in a couple sessions probably anyway in Call of Cthulhu. And then everybody just has fun. Right? So that's my suggestion to you. And if you are a GM... You shouldn't be afraid to go to your players and say, guys, I will continue to be the permanent GM, but could somebody give me a break for a couple months? I did that, and my players stepped up, okay? And um, they were happy to do it, and nobody, like, appreciated me less because I took a break. They all appreciated me, and they appreciated my best friend who did step up and do a six-month 
campaign when he wasn't really ready to run something because it was he did the same thing I did. It's either that or we don't play. So he stepped up for us so we could keep playing. Right? And then when the other guy took over, when my best friend wasn't ready, before we decided to switch to Dead, Deadlands, he said, I can run something for three or four months. Right? It won't be super long, but it'll be maybe six sessions. Right? Everybody appreciated. We all said thank you to those guys. Thank you for running something, because if you didn't, there might not be a game. Right? So, guys, if you, if you have a permit GM, please offer to give them a break. They might not say they need it, but offer. And if you are a permanent GM and you're feeling burnt out or starting to feel burnt out, go to your players. You don't even have to say I'm burning out. Just say, hey guys, I could use a short break. Would anybody, after we finish this dungeon, would anybody like to just run a game of something else for a few weeks just so that I can kind of get my second wind, right? It doesn't have to be a disaster. All you're, all you're doing is switching up a little bit. And that's my recommendation. I hope you guys have enjoyed. I will see you again when I'm level 24. And until next time, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been City of Heroes.